I started Rising Woman in about 2015, and it had been something that I was brewing within me for a really long time based on my early childhood history with trauma and abandonment and abuse. Um, I grew up in and out of foster homes and I struggled with addiction and just generally had no concept for healthy relationships whatsoever um, to the point where now when I see teenagers, you know, walking down the street, having like a healthy conversation with each other, I'm, I'm almost amazed because I had no concept for that as a young person. Um, so it took me a long time to learn how to feel safe at all in relationship with others. And um, my greatest challenge, I think, has been relationship, you know, romantic relationship. Um, I grew up not knowing my father, never having a relationship with him and actually being quite fearful of men. And so I naturally was drawn to unsafe people, unsafe partners. And so I went through a, a mini spiritual awakening in my early 20s when I went through a divorce. And uh, that story will be in my book, but it's, it's basically the most pivotal moment so far for me where everything sort of stripped away and I just woke up to my childhood wounds and I really saw how much I had been suppressing and denying my pain. And so I went down this rabbit hole of spiritual transformation with a spiritual teacher. I did shadow work, inner child work, a lot of uh, ancestral work and healing. I did a plant medicine ceremony. I just did everything. Ayahuasca? Was that, was I did a, yeah, I did. I, and I still work with ayahuasca mm -hmm. um, and all sorts of other different, you know, plant medicines that are available. Uh, and I sort of just went for it. That was like my main objective was to do my healing work because I was in so much pain and I was struggling so much with this abandonment wound that had been ripped open. And I really just didn't want to feel that powerless or that out of control ever again. Like I just felt so much pain in my body that I thought I might die in my sleep from the amount that I was grieving. And so my main objective was to, to do some clearing work on that. How and it was around, that, sorry, how, how long ago was that that you started this spiritual awakening uh you know about a decade ago is when i really started my spiritual seeking i would say just maybe yeah about 12 12 years ago i really started spiritual seeking and then about seven years or so ago is when i really got deep into it and really went all the way um and then of course now i'm, I'm married happily married and so that's a whole other version of deep in it. I want to talk to you about the conscious relationships. What is the definition of a conscious relationship and what is your experience with it and involvement with that? I really feel that a conscious relationship is simply the act of witnessing our behaviors and noticing our stories, noticing our minds rather than believing every thought we think. And so being conscious in relationship is not a whole lot different than a conventional relationship other than the fact that we no longer see our partner as somebody who is designed to meet all of our needs and do things the way that we do them and give us feelings. And instead they're there as a partner in life and an ally in our healing, but they also are our spiritual teacher. And so when my husband triggers something in me, that's my opportunity to bring it in a vulnerable way and to invite him to do a healing process with me or for me to take space to go and process that in myself. Uh, in a conventional relationship, if my husband triggers me, then there's something that he did wrong and there's something he needs to do in order to fix me so that I can feel better. So he's responsible for giving me a feeling or I'm responsible for giving him a feeling. Whereas in a conscious relationship, we're both wholly responsible for ourselves and we're both whole on our own. Mm -hmm. And we're just here to support each other in whatever work needs to be done. And I suppose the opposite of that would be codependent relationships. I've read a lot on your website about um, yeah, codependency and things like that. Um, what are your thoughts on why some of us have more of an issue with that than others and good ways to overcome that? Mm -hmm. 
everybody has some form of codependency because I think as human beings, again, we are so relational and we're meant to be together in life. Like we're, we're born to village, right? So this like really hyper colonized way of being where we're living in the nuclear family and everybody has to have their own power tools and their own house and their own everything and do everything independently. That's sort of uh, a, a way of, of creating separation and isolation. We're like drifting away from what's natural for us. And so there are many forms, I think, of codependency. The, the ones that are really troublesome are when we get into a pattern of caretaking uh, and putting ourselves in, in deep harm or at risk. Um, so this often looks like being in relationship with somebody who is suffering from an addiction or um, is abusive. And we think that it's our our job to fix them or to save them. And, you know, I'm not a trauma therapist. That's not the realm that I work in, but there are amazing groups. There's uh, one called Al-Anon, which is, you know, you've probably heard of it. Um, and it's a wonderful resource for people who need support in recovering from codependency. You'll find is that um, anyone who's in relationship with an addict deep in relationship, um, there's often codependency. Again, it's this polarization that happens where opposites attract. So um, if I'm looking for somebody to take care of, an addict is my perfect opportunity to come in and try and fix and save. So that is what it's for. But you'll find that anyone in, in Al-Anon, you know, they come from all sorts of backgrounds. It, it originally started with alcoholics, but um, all sorts of things, right? It can be substance use or gambling or just, you know, sheer mental illness. Um, and I think that it's a really great place for people who just need that place, that outlet to talk. Um, but the thing is, is that we just have to remember that we're not responsible for saving other people. And I think one of the most beautiful gifts we can give people when they are suffering or struggling is to remind them of their own power and to remind them that we trust them to do the work and that we trust them to heal. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's kind of interesting to think about it this way, but when we're operating in a codependent way, we're enabling right? We're, we're essentially saying like, I think that I know better than you. I'm better than you. I'm going to fix you. I'm going to make you all better because you just can't do that for yourself. And it sort of takes away any of that tension or that resistance that person might need that outside feedback from their own life to get the fire to change, right? And so this isn't to say that we don't want to support people if they're struggling and that we don't want to help provide them with resources and things like that. But um, there are lines and we have to have strong boundaries with ourselves and, and put our care and our, you know, our own primary needs at the forefront as well. Otherwise, we're just self-abandoning. And I think that that's a really great way to distract from our own emotions. Like if I'm so focused on saving or fixing someone, I don't have to think about my own, my own trauma or my own feeling of unworthiness. I don't have to tune into why is it that I would rather, you know, pour myself out endlessly for somebody else rather than just sit and be with myself. You know, what is it in me that I don't believe in? Mm. We're very creative with our methods of distraction, aren't we? <laughs> yes, it's so annoying. <laughs> Catching yourself. <laughs> um, and what do you think, I mean, is there a difference between codependency and love addiction? What, what are the differences? You know, I would not say that I'm a huge expert on like the specific terminology. So I want to be careful with like putting, you know, nails in the coffin as to like what I think the differences are. But from my experience and from what I've seen, I think, you know, codependency often does involve some sort of harmful behavior where we are, you know, enabling somebody in some way or we're over giving or pouring ourselves out so that somebody else can continue on and often not respect our boundaries um, simply because they can't or they won't. Mm. Love addiction I see as oftentimes this, it can be codependence, but it can also be somebody who is just really constantly addicted to being wanted and needed in relationship. And so in that process, really abandoning their own needs, abandoning their own boundaries, and really not thinking about, you know, is this the right relationship for me? Is this healthy for me? It simply comes down to like getting that security and that approval, even if it's very short lived. And so you'll often see somebody like constantly chasing love and being in relationship or chasing relationship that isn't healthy for them, no matter what, because they're afraid to be alone. 
and again comes from the relationship the early relationships with caregivers Mm -hmm. yeah if we are not in relationship with ourselves because we learned to self-abandon at a very early age it's going to be really hard to be in relationship with others in a healthy way so and what do you mean by self-abandon when we're self-abandoning we're again we're we're not trusting ourselves we're not identifying our own boundaries we're not listening to our own inner needs um and self-abandonment can be as simple as saying that there's something that's important to us and saying that there's something that we need and then totally abandoning that if it doesn't work for someone else, right? Totally abandoning that if somebody else has a request and, uh, it, and it doesn't line up and what is true for us and, you know, standing up for ourselves in the process of entering into relationship, um, if we have plans and then we just cancel them because somebody, you know, somebody that we're romantically interested in is inviting us out on a date. Um, We just ditch all of our friends. That's another example of self-abandonment. And I I think that women are perhaps more susceptible of that. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And I think um, part of it is just, you know, we're very relational. We're very relational. We're wired for a relationship. Not that, that men aren't, but I'm just wondering in your opinion, when do you, how do you differentiate between this is an unhealthy relationship, I'm just going to let it go, and it, I'm running away from myself, perhaps I need to sit in it and work through the issues? Mm-hmm. It's such a tough question to answer for anyone other than that person answering it for themselves. And that's why I usually, if I do write articles like that, I'm often, I use a lot of caveats, like, you know, you have to trust yourself, but there are some obvious deal breakers, of course, when we're talking about abuse, right? If we're talking about serious boundary violations or just like a sheer unwillingness for that other person to do the work with us, if, you know, if it's just impossible, then of course there's nothing else that we can do. I think in our culture, we tend to leave relationship too early often because we're looking for perfection. And so it's sort of a line that I dance in my work often where as a relationship writer, where I'm talking about, you know, the spiritual gifts that we can get when we lean into relationship by staying in the game and, you know, asking ourselves deeper questions about what this person represents for us and how we can heal together. Um, But also knowing that there are hard lines, like we don't accept abuse. And and if there are serious, you know, red flags, that it's okay to walk away and you can get the lesson in that way as well. Mm -hmm. So I think it really does come down to having that compass of, you know, what are your boundaries? And then do you know what are, you know, the non-negotiable red flags? If we come from a place of trauma or abuse in the past, sometimes these really negative experiences in relationship are normalized. And so I noticed this for myself when I was really young, thinking that certain types of abuses were normal, right? Because that's how I grew up. And so then it comes down to really getting that outside support, like having a coach or a therapist or somebody who you can work with, who can help guide you so that you can figure that stuff out Um, but a lot of times it's not an abusive relationship it's just that you guys bicker or you fight and um, you don't see eye to eye and you have poor communication skills you don't know how to connect you don't know how to ask for what you want or need um, in a non-aggressive way and so everything becomes a fight and that is just a pretty classic relationship dynamic that most of us have experienced Mm -hmm. because we're not taught how to just be in our hearts together we're taught that you know somebody has to be right and somebody has to be wrong Mm -hmm. somebody wins in a conflict and somebody loses we've never been taught that conflict is an opportunity for us to get to know our partner deeper, for us to learn how to get our needs met in a really honoring way. So there's sort of this uh, fine line that we have to walk, but also it comes down to knowing ourselves. If we know what it is that we want in relationship and we can speak that out, then we can actually qualify people before we even get into relationship deeply. We don't spend much time in that process leading up to. So we don't say like, hey, this is the kind of relationship that I want. This is the kind of communication that I'm looking for. This is the kind of work I'm looking to do. Like, are you into that? Mm. Are Are you game to go deep in relationship with me and build something consciously? Right. And these are the kinds of conversations my husband and I had before we decided to be an item. Right. So how long do you, did you know each other or did you, 
it take to get to know each other before you? Um, we only took about one month actually. So it was really fast, but in that time, it was a lot of conversations, a lot yeah. of agreements. We wrote letters, we wrote lists, we revealed like our traumas to each other. Um, we shared life stories. We qualified like what kind of relationship we wanted, what we wanted to build, what we needed, um, what we were afraid of and the things that we still needed to work on within ourselves. And uh, we sat in front of each other and we're like, are you ready to do this work? And um, we both agreed that we were. And so, you know, a um, month and a half into our relationship, two months in, we actually ended up working with a spiritual teacher and we started doing Tantra and shadow work and inner child work. And we did that for four and a half years together. Okay. So we kind of took the uh, intensity route. <laughs> Um, actually, which brings me to my next question. So what sort of, um, I know you mentioned support, um, you know, is, is advisable if we're having trouble in relationships, triggering things. What sort mm -hmm. of support mechanisms, you talk about a spiritual teacher, I mean, what, there are many, you know, anything from psychologists to mm -hmm. um, inner child work, but what have you found to be most helpful? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, working with a teacher or working with a therapist, somebody who's really aligned with your spiritual beliefs, somebody that you feel safe with, um, joining uh, groups, like if you want to join a group like Al-Anon or we have, you know, women's groups and my husband runs men's groups like the Samurai Brotherhood. Um, there's lots of online communities that you might find that you feel really safe in to, you know, kind of grow and heal together. We're about to launch a membership site as well, where we're going to bring people together for monthly workshops and things like that. Um, and I think it's also just really important to, you know, experiment, experiment with different healing modalities and find out what feels really good for you. Mm -hmm. um, doing somatic work, though, is like hands down really important. I think getting into our bodies and really relearning how to heal from the inside out is important. So getting in touch with our feelings and knowing, you know, what is my body doing when I'm feeling triggered and how can I come home to myself? Um, that's going to give us the power to do the work and to be able to observe what's happening rather than feel carried away by it. Mm. A lot of um, traditional ways of getting counselling and things like that tend to be, in my experience anyway, quite mental, not so much um, in, in the body. Mm. Um, what are some of the modalities that you suggest for actually feeling getting in touch because a lot of people find it hard to actually know what they're feeling it's so shut mm -hmm. down mm -hmm. well I think that's the thing right as our culture is pretty obsessed with the mind our culture is so obsessed with um, this idea that if we want to heal all we have to do is think positively and ultimately that's not really how it works I think our bodies are incredibly brilliant and they store all of our traumas and our memories and our nervous systems literally house all of our past experiences and then they wire for how to respond in the future and so if we've experienced a past trauma then our nervous system is like okay I know how to respond to this and so even if it's a perceived threat our nervous system is going to respond as if it's real and so when we think about that, you can't just outthink your trauma. You need to actually heal it. You need to work with your body. So a good example that I gave earlier, I think, was just that, that process of tuning into your feelings. Like, what is it that you're feeling? Is it heavy? Is it light? Is it sharp? Mm -hmm. um, what color is it? What shape is it? You know, what, do, what words does it have for you? Can you talk to your feelings, right? Kind of like create an entity out of it. And so that you can sort of begin to communicate with your body by noticing where that feeling is. Sometimes it might be tension, you know, in a certain part of your body, or you might feel tingling, or you might feel a heaviness, or maybe your heart is beating quickly. What is it? So uh, tuning in requires that we slow down and that we sort of do a scan of where our emotions are living in our bodies and we name them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So observing, taking the time to observe our bodies. And would you also recommend observing our thoughts too? Yeah. I mean, that's, that that's, early, but, yeah, know. that's the always the practice. That's always the practice of conscious awareness is observing your mind and not believing every thought you think, you know, noticing that the mind is there to protect you um, by making up a whole bunch of stories that will keep you at arm's length from love. It'll distance you from connection. Um, because when we're in connection, that's when we're the most vulnerable, right? 
Mm. So the ego kind of has one job. It's like protect from vulnerability. (laughs) Um, Unfortunately, that also makes it so that we can't really be in relationship. So in order to be in relationship, we have to do the scary thing, which is be vulnerable. And that requires that we know how our ego reacts when it feels threatened. And then we have the tools to self-nurture and reconnect back to body Mm. and to notice like, okay, here's my mind making up a story again, you know? Here, here I go thinking the worst. Okay, I, I love you. You're safe. Relax. Breathe. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to be in relationship. Mm. Um, and learning the tools to actually speak that out loud to someone as well. Mm. It's interesting that we all, you know, as you said, we all carry an abandonment wound. Some are quite debilitating in, as mm-hmm. far as forming healthy, sustainable relationships. Um, and often it's, I think, I mean, would you agree that people don't necessarily give themselves permission to have those feelings because they think, oh, my childhood was, was okay. I mean, my parents loved me. I wasn't abused or left yet. There's obviously something that comes up. So it can be a little bit harder to, um, perhaps diagnose and, um, give yourself the time and the space to to heal and recognize those issues if it isn't an overtly abusive or neglectful background would you agree oh totally and and that's so, that's so true for so many people especially because you know there's such thing as pre-verbal trauma right mm-hmm. so there's trauma that we can endure before we're even verbal mm-hmm. for example you know being born prematurely or you know being born by c-section and then being separated from our mother for a couple of days like i was born uh, by emergency c-section and then didn't see my mom for three days that's pre-verbal trauma and so many of us have these things and it's no fault uh, to our parents but these things happen mm-hmm. right you know for two weeks old and one of our parents goes in for surgery uh, and doesn't come home for 10 days, that's abandonment in, mm-hmm. uh, to an infant. Mm-hmm. So um, there are so many different forms of abandonment, including emotional abandonment, where our parents were there, but they, maybe they were grieving the loss of somebody. You know, maybe something big happened in their life, or maybe they just never had the tools, and so they weren't emotionally there for us. Mm-hmm. That can also feel like a trauma not having that emotional support or that nurturance that we need to develop a secure attachment. But yeah, again, we don't give ourselves permission to feel our feelings. Everything is very much comparison based. It's, um, you know, competition based as well. So who has suffered more? Therefore, my trauma is not important or my feelings aren't as important because you went through more than me. Um, and we all carry these kind of stories of not enoughness. And my work is really centered around how how each of us can come back to ourselves and validate our stories without letting our stories be come us. I don't want to identify as what has happened to me. What I have gone through has made me who I am and I've taken lessons from it, but it's not my identity. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where many of us get confused as we think that we are our past. We are the things that we have done or we are the things that have happened to us. Mm -hmm. And so that self-validation piece I think is vital to being able to heal. Mm. Um, and guilt too, um, not wanting to perhaps acknowledge wounds because of uh, loyalty to our caregivers and things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and you can have both, right? Like we can feel anger for someone and love them. Mm-hmm. And we can acknowledge the ways that someone hurt us and still love them, right? And we can care about people and still not have them in our lives too. Like there's so many nuances. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that we have to recognize that, you know, emotions and healing is complicated and there's no one way to feel and there's no right way to feel. And you can feel many things at once and all of that is welcome, Mm. right? And it's sometimes quite complex and contradictory. Uh, But the truth is, is that many of us didn't have our emotional needs met or our physical needs met sometimes by our caregivers. And we can acknowledge that while also knowing that they did the best that they could with what they had. And maybe that wasn't enough. And it's okay to acknowledge that to yourself. What else do you offer on your website? You've got, do you offer programs? Um, yeah and uh, there's what what are your range of services? Obviously yeah. reading material is primary. <laughs> Great articles. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have a YouTube channel where I do a bunch of talks and things like that. I do lots of interviews there. And that's one of my favorite ways to connect is to do the YouTube interviews. Um, so that's Outrising Woman. And then on the website, we that's have Outrising Woman. Did you say? Yeah. yeah. On YouTube. Yep. And then uh, we have a program called Becoming the One. And that program is designed to help you understand yourself deeper. It's, a, it's an introductory program to the inner work. So learning about yourself, what it is that you want in relationship, um, what are your expectations, what are realistic expectations versus these codependent ideas that we've been fed. Um, and then we take you through the process of creating a love map of designing what you want your future relationship to look like. But it's also mostly about you doing the inner work to get yourself there. And then um, my husband and I just launched a couples course called Creating Conscious Love. And uh, that is an intimacy course. And we also guide you through tools and practices to uh, deepen in connection with your partner and learn how to resolve conflict. And also we give date night exercises. So some of the things that we do together, like breath work and eye gazing and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have a program about healing your relationships that's on our website, which is all about a deep dive into the inner work. Mm. Um, and so people can do those from anywhere in the world that's all online, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, everything that we offer is completely digital and worldwide. So, okay. and, and that's been a beautiful gift because we have literally people from every pocket of the world who take our programs and join our groups. And it's, it's been amazing to see that like we all kind of do struggle with the same things in relationship and uh, to come together and, and support each other. It's just such a gift. No matter the backgrounds and culture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's all it's always difficult and we all struggle with very similar things. You know, there's differences in cultural ideas or religions, uh, but ultimately like our hearts kind of struggle with the same things. It's feeling like not enough or not being heard, or not being understood, um, things like that. And those are the kinds of things that we work through in our programs. Lovely. And people can uh, find out about those at risingwoman.com. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I also have a free gift. It's a inner child meditation that I created. And that's the meditation that I put myself through when I was healing my own anxious attachment. Um, so I literally did that process for myself like every single night. And so eventually I recorded it and it's free. You can just download it right on wow. our website. Fantastic. I'll be doing that one for sure. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to share, comment on, you think that our readers would like to benefit from? You know, I think one of the takeaways that I always like to say is that, you know, it's, it's not a race and there's no end goal. I think in our personal development world, we have this real idea that we're somehow broken or that we need to be fixed or um, that we're trying to get somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I see life as just such a journey. We're constantly unfolding and expanding and becoming. And I like to encourage everyone to just really love themselves where they're at and also really honor their past selves for all of the things that their past selves did to get them to this moment. Mm -hmm. um, because when we start doing the work, there can be shame and there can be guilt. And my role, I hope, as a writer is to remind people that, you know, there, there doesn't need to be shame when you turn over a stone and there doesn't need to be shame when you go into the dark. It's, mm -hmm. it's about reclaiming mm -hmm. and really, you know, owning who you are and, and accepting all your parts. Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much for your time. It was lovely to meet you. Thank you. I'll be following you on your website. Wonderful. And YouTube. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. Great. Thanks very much.